Am I live? I think I'm live. Hmm. Let's see what happens. I just did an update to this software. It says I'm live. Well, that's a good sign. Let's see if anybody shows up. If you're here, whoa! I said show up, two people. Um, <laughs> hey, Brandon. Hey, Thaddeus. Happy Wednesday, everybody. The 25th of January, or maybe the 26th, depending on where you are. Or could it be the 24th for some people? I don't think so. I know when I went to Japan that when I flew back that I landed an hour earlier than I had taken off. Crazy. All right, well, here we are. Welcome to the C47's channel, if you have not been here before. Um, if you have not been here before and you like things having to do with production, lighting, cameras, audio, grip, electric, and a bit of nonsense, then, you know, the subscribe thing, the notification, blah, blah, blah. Patrick, good to have you here. Um... Yes, I still have the, it's not a Seaboard though, which is another kind of keyboard. It's the Mini Freak from Arturia. I've been having fun with it. It has not just been sitting here. And I got another, I call it a toy, it's not really, but uh, a model samples for, uh, for new school beat making from Electron. So those are the two music acquisitions that are new to the studio. And, uh, yeah, it's not really for work. It's for, it's sort of in that same category as cooking for me. So how's everybody doing? As always on this channel, when we do the live stream, unless I say otherwise, where I might be doing a demo and I say, let's hold for questions and answers. This particular episode or live stream is not based on editing again later on. So I'm not going to re-edit this and upload it. So Q&A is open for the duration. I'll be checking out the comments and reactions as we go through. Um, I thought I'd do something a little bit different. I was going to do sort of a live setup here and I don't have talent. I'm not promising that a mannequin will not come back into the fold at some point in the future. And the reason is, is because when you don't have talent, you can actually work out a lot of lighting setups that way. Um, Brandon asks, and uh, if you're in the chat, put in at the C47, if you remember, it just helps me sort of put my attention on there. Hey, Mitch, off topic, what do you use to organize all of your camera batteries and chargers in studio and on location? Um, I have, it's on the other side of this wall, well, on the other side of this background, which is uh, this monstrosity right here, which is amazing, which I've been using. Uh, look, Anakin, because <laughs> I've been working out some lighting setups because I have my NAD, NAB workshops and stuff coming up. You don't have to say sorry. Um, so on the other side back here, I have an equipment room and in there I have basically a, a big table, like a slab. And there I have a, a giant strip where I set up all my battery chargers and things. So that's kind of where that happens. When I'm on the road, um, let me go and plug something. I'll be right back. It won't take long. I use these a lot. Um, they're squids, or I call them squids. This particular one has five uh, out outlets that you can plug into, and then obviously that plugs into the wall, and it has a switch. I have another one that I believe has six of them. So they don't weigh a lot. And when I'm on the road, I usually uh, you know, throw those onto the top of my bag. And then that way, depending on what type of batteries I'm charging, I can set them up. And I don't have problems with the chargers getting in the way because they're squiddy and they're floppy. Uh, so that's kind of how I charge them when I'm on location. And that way, when I get back into the hotel room, if I've got, you know, 10 batteries to charge, then I can do that. 
I use Tenba bags a lot when I travel, and they have this uh, line called the Roadie line. And the one that I take with me that goes in the overhead has little grooves on both sides. It's basically the place where the handle comes up. So it kind of comes into the bag, but then there's recessed areas, almost like a U shape. And what I do is I use that, especially for Sony NPF style batteries. It's a great place to just sort of stack the, all the batteries there. So I can usually get about 10 batteries um, into that bag that way. And then, you know, if I've got larger V mount or gold mount, then I'll sometimes travel with those. But usually it's easier to have that be part of a uh, rental package. So hopefully that helped, Brandon. Any other questions before we get into some other things? Patrick, uh, Mitch, Thaddeus, anybody else who's here on the stream? We're sitting under double digits right now. Just uh, housekeeping wise, if there's any other questions coming up in the... Oh, you said sorry because you didn't put at the C47. It's totally fine. Uh, Brandon. Next week, we're back with a full house for Cameron Flask, myself, Ben Barden, and Caleb Pike. Um, lots of general Q&A and discussions about equipment, but also probably talking a little bit about NAB 2023, the workshops that I have coming up, which both Ben and Caleb will be there with me. And just very briefly, we're going to be doing a setup on the 13th of April, a workshop on the 14th, which will be small to no crew, corporate, in-house, and remote production. And then on the Saturday, small to no crew, cinematic video lighting. So they are considerably different. Both workshops will have lighting in them, but the workshop on the Friday, the corporate in-house and remote will be more geared towards those types of projects. So definitely interview lighting, some tabletop stuff, uh, and then remote production, which is kind of what I'm doing nowadays most of the time from here anyway. And then the Saturday workshop will be more, well, it'll only be lighting focused basically, and there'll be more setups for lighting. We'll have a small set with flats and it'll be dressed a little bit uh, we'll be inside, outside, stuff like that. Yeah. Creative video tips. I listen in the background as I'm working, but almost always learn a thing or two each stream. I appreciate that. And uh, where can I get signed up for them? It's on NAB's website, Brandon, and they are paid workshops. They're through Future Media Concepts. I don't handle that part. I basically design and create the workshops. I... Um, help find the space. It's going to be at a location, as far as I know, called MG Studio, where we've done it a few years ago. And it's a big space, so it can take 25 to 30 people each day, and we can have a hands-on workshop. Um, they provide water, a little bit of craft services, a lunch each day, and we start at nine, we end at five, and we just kind of go. And lunchtime is, you know, scheduled as an hour, but sometimes it kind of becomes a pseudo working lunch when we're doing stuff. So very production uh, focused. Yeah. What other questions while we have everybody here? This uh, paltry seven, but a great seven people here. And hopefully a few more will show up. But obviously there's the rewatches and all that fun stuff as well. So any other questions at all before we jump into something, again, a little bit different lighting-wise for today? Um, I wouldn't say it's completely out of the box, but I wanted to get into a little bit more of the theory and then seeing some of that in a practical but virtual practical application. So just looking one more time. Ah, here we go. Mitch. Do you have a rule of thumb for the lighting ratio of subject to background in general, single subject interview setups? I don't have a rule of thumb. Um, you know, I tend to like backgrounds to fall off a little bit. So there's usually at least, you know, a couple of stops difference between the subject matter and the background. But that is totally dependent upon the space. I mean, this is obviously a much moodier background because I'm using this granite, you know, um, painted style background that is behind me. But 
um, you know, if you're in a, let's say, a really beautiful architectural space that has a lot of ambient light, then your ratios are going to be much closer to each other in terms of subject and background. So there's no hard, fast rule. Um, a lot of it has to do with how much the environment and the background, and in certain degrees, depending on your setup and and your composition, sometimes the foreground, because usually what happens is your subject is, whatever that subject is, is it's occupying the middle ground of your frame. So sometimes there's nothing in the foreground. Uh, sometimes you'll shoot it a little bit dirty. So that might be that you're seeing the back of somebody's head and their shoulders, or there might be something out of focus in the foreground. Then you see middle ground, which is usually the focus of your subject matter and then background. So what's behind it? And, you know, you have to think about that in terms of composition, in terms of ratios. And then if, if you have talent that's moving, then there's the blocking component too. So, you know, when it comes to cinematography and you talk about that as a subject, it's really comprised of three parts. You've got lighting, you've got composition. So what does that frame look like? And then you have camera movement. And the purpose of camera movement in cinematography is generally to reveal something or to follow something. That's usually what you're doing with the camera. Um, sometimes you're doing both of those things. You're following a subject matter. It could be a, an object, a, a thing, a car, or a, you know, whatever it's going to be could be a person or people, and you're following them, and then you generally will um, reveal something when you're doing that, or it may just be following, but usually there's a reveal component to camera mo uh, movement as well. Creative video tips. Curious uh, my thoughts on mixing brand slash lighting apps on the phone. I'm not sure if I totally get that. Um, I'm going to give you what I think is an answer to that question, which is we have lots of fixtures now on the market. Let's just throw some out there. We've got um, Aperture, we've got Nanlite, we've got Westcott, we've got Roscoe, we've got all of these different brands. We've got Quasar and light panels. And let's say you own um, one big fixture from Aperture, you have another fixture you like to use from Felix, and another one you like to use from um, Westcott, and you want to control those lights remotely without going up to the fixtures. Well, now you're dealing with multiple apps, and I think that's kind of a pain in the ass, to be honest with you. Um, they, you know, Airy has a great app. Um, Aperture with Sidus has a great app, very easy to use. Um, most of the manufacturers are really upping their app game now. Um, Luxly, which is uh, Rift Labs, which is also the company behind Kelvin, they have a great app. So um, I don't love having multiple apps on there. Like, for instance, right now I have my kicker here, which is just an uh, Amarin, which is all part of the Aperture family. Um, the P60C, it's at about 20% right now, 3,200 Kelvin. Um, so I, th I think the answer now that I'm seeing your follow-up question is there are certain brands that I like their app implementation better than others. Um, Aperture has a very clear implementation. So does Airy. Um, so does Luxly. So those are three that I really like, but none of them are hard to use. It's just, it sometimes makes sense to use the same brand of light across the boards for two main reasons, in my opinion. One is the app reason, because then you're in a singular app and you're controlling individual fixtures or groups of fixtures, but all within one place. Um, I'm still a huge fan of member of the original Aperture remote, and this is a remote for Nanlite, um, and you basically just assign a channel, and you can go ahead and set that up, and and I like that. I like that I can change intensity, I can change.
color temperature. I can change whether or not the light is on or off. And I can set it up so that I have different channels. So you, you set your DMX channel. This particular one is set to channel three, my key. And I can turn that on and off. And I don't have to peck around an app. I don't have to rely upon a smartphone or a tablet to do that. But it is necessary sometimes. And... I think as soon as you start getting into the realm of bigger productions with lots of fixtures, then it does make a lot of sense to have app-based control. Um, the second reason to stick with a single or, or as close as possible to a single brand, and that's impossible in a lot of scenarios because you're looking for a certain type of light with certain types of qualities, is SSI. And that's a reading of sort of how that light, um, it's not just color spectrum, but I guess the best way to describe it, and you know, Matt Allard brings SSI into all of his light reviews on New Shooter, is I kind of think about it maybe incorrectly, but I think about it more in the respect of reflected light. Because, you know, we have similar problem with camera systems and lighting fixtures, which is that most companies, especially that are a little bit more mature, I don't mean in attitude, but I mean they've been around for a while, will uh, sort of settle on an approach to how they're designing their lights. And think of that as something that's similar to sensors and cameras. Now, the problem we have with almost all camera manufacturers is they don't even abide by that. They are constantly coming out with new camera models with different sensors, and those sensors react differently to reflected light off of objects and subject matter and people and all of those things. So even if you have a, a two-year-old Canon camera and then you have a new Canon camera, if they have different sensors, you may seemingly be setting those two cameras up the same way, but the end result of your captured image can be different. And that also, I'm, I'm not trying to confuse this, but is also not dissimilar when it comes to lights. Think about the light engine as sort of the camera sensor. It's a little bit different because it's it's an out in, in as opposed to an in, right? So the camera is capturing something, the light is outputting something. So outputting, capturing. Um, but the problem is that, let's say one manufacturer decides that they're gonna design their lights using RGBWW. So they've got a red, green, blue, um, you know, LED. Uh, emitter and and usually the way it works actually is the the it, it's not always the case but a, a lot of the times what will happen is there's especially in a traditional single color led light or a bicolor led light is you'll have blue leds and then in in front of that directly on or separated with remote phosphor um, you'll have phosphor and phosphor is what the the blue led hits it excites it, um, and then it, depending on the formula of that phosphor, will produce a particular color temperature. So if it, um, you know, generally if you look at it and it looks more orange, it's probably going to produce a, um, a, a more tungsten or a warmer sort of in that 3200 Kelvin range. And if it looks more yellowish when it gets excited, it tends to create a more blue light and that would be more daylight balanced. And then you combine those together to get different color temperatures. It's a little more complicated with RGB and the RGB um, approach to fixtures. And then in addition to red, green, blue, because if you mix those together to produce white, it's very hard to get an accurate, uh, good color spectrum of white. What they do is, depending on the manufacturer, they might do red, green, blue, and then a white and a white. And there'll be two different whites. So one's more amber and one's more, you know, daylight or bluish. And then the combination of those five different um, LEDs, red, green, blue, white, white, 
are what are combined to create the different colors that you're getting for hue saturation uh, and intensity modes and gel modes and all of those special effects modes, so on and so forth. Other manufacturers will just have RGB and then a single white. That's less common now because you want to get the best color spectrum possible. And then other manufacturers will do something like RGB ACL, which is amber, cyan, and lime. And by combining those six different colors, uh, Kelvin does that, the Airy Orbiter does that, Hive, I believe, is ACL, but they're definitely were one of the first companies to have a different combination of LEDs. The theory is RGB ACL, as opposed to RGB WW, should give you an even broader um, color spectrum and also change the way reflected light is off of objects. So when you, when you see light getting reflected off of an orange and a banana, and let's just say, for giggles, a red apple, when you use each one of those different lights from different manufacturers, even though all of those lights might be uh, tuned in terms of CCT or correlated color temperature to 5600 Kelvin or 3200 Kelvin, what a camera sees in terms of that reflected light off of those three pieces of fruit could be completely different from one another. And the combinations are just mind boggling. And the problem is that if you have a particular camera and let's say you're smart about it and you go out on the job and you have a multi-camera shoot um, and you decide to choose all of the same cameras with all of the same sensors, then you are in fact being smart about it because at least that's a baseline. If you set all of those cameras up the same way and you black balance, if that's an option, and you white balance those cameras to the same thing, then in theory, the captured image should be identical uh, or close to identical with all of those cameras, save for your exposure settings and depth of field, you know, aperture settings, so on and so forth. Um, you get the idea. So the problem is that if you're using different manufacturers' lights, the output of the light source, they all have these different SSIs, and some of those lights from different manufacturers will play well with each other, and other ones will be quite different. And that's kind of the reason why, if you have the choice and the fixtures that you need in terms of the type of fixtures, hard light, soft light, flood, you know, more spot, if you can, and form factor, of course, you know, panels versus tubes versus whatever else, COB, chip on board. If you can have all of those lights within the same company's family and using the same approach, right? Because a, a company four years ago might have used just um, RGBW and, or, and now they're doing RGBWW or they never existed as a company and now they're doing RGB, amber, cyan, lime. Then if you stay within the same family, and then you, on the camera side, stay with the same sensor and the same family of lenses, then your captured image will be much more predictable than if you start mixing. But that's, again, what's great about somebody like Matt Allard at New Shooter is when he's testing a new light, he will actually talk about SSI and even do some tests sometimes where he's comparing it to other lights from other manufacturers and really trying to figure out how well they, um, you know, how well they play together. So you guys get that. Um, yeah, but, and, you know, DMX is really a communication um you know, what do you call it? <laughs> I've gone blank. It's it's a way of of being able to communicate with lights, right? And there's and there's different flavors of DMX. And and DMX is great when you are trying to either at a lighting board or through an app control many, many different lights. Um 
it doesn't solve the problem of SSI because that's inherent to, you know, TLCI, all that stuff. That's inherent to the fixture itself. And you can't really change the way the light engine was designed. But DMX is great to make everything communicate together. And there are solutions out there. I believe Sidus is actually more open source. So you should be able to, if a manufacturer allows it, to use one person's app to control more than one manufacturer's lighting fixture. So um, not person, but companies. I hope that all made sense. Um, the short answer is try to match your fixtures to one brand, your cameras to one brand, your lenses to one brand. That's the most predictable scenario. And you'll start to learn how to tune all of those components. You can't do much about the lenses except for filters, but you can definitely tune your camera because it's digital and has settings and your lights, especially if it has like a green magenta setting and some other things in there so that um, you're getting predictable results from those on a regular basis. Who knew we were going down that road? But I'm down for it. Uh, any other questions on that? Any follow-ups to what I said? Lemon water is good for you. Well, that's my opinion, but who am I to say? Nothing else? No? Let's see. What do we got? Um, hodgepodge of brands. Most people do creative video tips, um, myself included. In fact, I'm using two brands of lights right now. I've got a, a Nanlite Mix Panel 150, and I've got an Ameren P60C. I sometimes just mix them up because I'm trying different things in the studio. But it is more common than uncommon to see multiple brands within somebody's kit, um, partially because they purchased over time. But even in a rental house situation, it's what's available. You know, they may not have every fixture that you're looking for and have that available. But if you can keep it within one family, it's generally a good idea. Now that said, you know, I said that over time things change. The light engine that drives an airy orbiter is completely different than the light engine that drives the sky panel, which is an RGBW fixture. And then you have RGB ACL for the orbiter. Um, the orbiter is a much newer fixture. It's an evolution of their light sort of approach to LED and their light engine is different. And I would be surprised going forward if even in the sky panel format, that we don't see at some point an update from Mary where they're going to settle on RGB ACL because they want all of their lights to work well with each other. And, you know, sometimes in very specific situations, if you think about it, the sky panel came out when there were not a lot of panel based LED fixtures on the market. We had light panels, we had uh, some stuff from Kino Flow. We had the Airy stuff. And the Airy stuff, understandably, um, was first and foremost designed to work well with Airy cameras. So even if that light didn't produce the desired result that you were looking for with a different camera and sensor, it generally, um, it generally was you know, going to give you amazing results if you're shooting with an Alexa, because that's the matchup. Patrick says, is that light bulb to your right sitting up in a roll of light colored gaff tape, or is it that a super simple tabletop base and we just don't see the cord? <laughs> it's neither, uh, Patrick. It's just a little light that um, takes, let me see, I haven't looked at it in a while, three AAA batteries, and it just turns on and off. Um, good for lighting demonstrations or just to have a little light in the background. And then this is the little aperture uh, bulb light. Um, I, f I forget what the name of it is. <laughs> I'm uh, RCE27. Is that what they actually call it? It's a seven watt draw. Um, you charge it 
in a regular light socket. I don't even think it has uh, a USB input, which would be great, to be honest with you. Maybe it does. I don't think so. I've had a couple of these for a while, um, but we'll, we'll take a look at those in a minute. Hopefully that answered the question. All right. B7C. There you go. E27 is just the uh, the type of threading. So I don't know why the name's not on here. It might be. Let's see. Boom, boom, boom. Nope. Hey, maybe they put it on nowadays. Or maybe I'm just blind, which I am kind of. All right. Here we go, kids. Let's jump in. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Dangerous territory. And um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple of things. Hopefully this works. You know, again, I'm always leery about what can happen in the interwebs land. There we go. You can see that, right? Give me feedback in the chat because I'm sharing. It's a novel idea. Uh, let me move this stupid screen over here. Um, still loving Ecamm, by the way. Ecamm Live. Great product. They're releasing version 4 tomorrow. And uh, I'm on the beta for it. Seems to be working well. I got to tell you that that company develops. They keep going. All right, here we go. Boom. No, I lied. Now because I moved the screen. Here we go. Uh, check that out. The c47.teachable.com. I have my first course up there. It's on split or side lighting. And we're going to talk about uh, a couple of things. We'll talk about subject matter and we'll talk about lights a little bit. And we'll kind of talk this out. So um, subject matter to me is what is it that is in the frame? Is it a person or people? Is it an object or objects? Or are you just filming or capturing an area? Or is it combinations of all of those? So again, subject matter is what's the focus of your particular scene or the shot or what you're doing. It's pretty clear when you're shooting an interview what that subject matter is. But if you're doing tabletop, it might be a can of soda or it might be a box uh, of a type of cereal and a bowl of cereal. So whatever that is. And then it might be that you're just setting up an establishing shot that is of an area or a particular architectural feature or something like that. So that's the first thing. You have to determine what that is. And then we start to talk about things like light positions. And light positions, to me, kind of fall into two main categories. You have your lateral horizontal position of your lights, and that can dictate certain things like central lighting, off-center lighting, which we sometimes call loop lighting, cross or Rembrandt lighting. That can be dependent upon the height. Uh, I should close that up. I just <laughs> added that. It's obviously a missing. <laughs> you can see what happened. Uh, parentheses. And then um, side lighting or split lighting. Um, side rear lighting, rim lighting or a kicker, and then back lighting. So that's kind of you know what I think about there. And then you have your elevated or vertical position. And that really has to do with the height. So you can define that as under lighting, which is sort of be minus 35 to 45 degrees from the subject matters sort of zero position. Uh, level lighting, which would be at the zero position. Low medium, uh, plus 20 to 30 degrees. Medium, 40 to 45 degrees. High to, high to medium, plus 60 high plus 75 and then top lighting which is generally directly from above which would be uh, 90 degrees and then of course there are based on you know uh, the lateral horizontal position that can affect sort of the way your subject matter looks so let me just bump uh, out of this we'll see how long it takes Shouldn't have it built. It should just all be there, I guess. Boom. And then we looked at this. Bear with me. I think we have time. Maybe we don't, but it's a live stream. Who cares? And then boom. And then you combine these lateral and elevated positions, and you then add the number and the types of lights, and that really 
dictates and allows you to achieve lighting setups, looks, and moods, right? So that's kind of a, a, a pretty quick way of talking about it. Um, we're going to take a look at a program that can help kind of illustrate that in a second. I'm just going to close that up. Um, but I want to know if there's any questions you have about any of that before I get into the other stuff. So feel free. And if you are looking for, I don't know if this will switch over. Let's see if it behaves itself. You never know with the way things are setting set up here, but I think I have a way to verify. So just give me a second. Um, what I can do is get a, a feed of all of my cameras and see if this one is showing up or not. It might not be. You never know. Let's see. Boom. Is it behaving itself? It is. Look, it's behaving itself. So over here, um, you may have seen me talk about this book in the past. It's called Lighting for Portraiture. It's by Walter Nurnberg. You can get pretty much any edition of this book. Um, but some of the later editions, um, you know, are slightly updated, but they're all essentially the same. And inside of this book, who was the owner here? Bowel Williams? That can't be right. There's no way that somebody's name is Bowel, but you never know. Um, Walter Nuremberg has a, a very clever system for these different lateral positions and, um, you know, these different uh, horizontal or, you know, elevated positions, uh, lateral, horizontal, you're elevated, you know, sort of vertical, and the combinations of all of those. And um, it's it's relatively infinite. And the the focus of the book is portraiture. But honestly, these ideas and these concepts, they relate to lighting pretty much any subject matter. You just have to scale up or down depending on what you're doing. So hopefully that makes sense. Any, uh, any questions? I'm here. I'm here for you kids. What you got for me? All right. Nothing at all. All right. I'll keep going. And then from there, if you have questions, you can ask me. Oh, wait, something showed up. I got a copy of that. It's a great book. It is a great book. And it's, you know, a book you can only get used nowadays. But it is pretty fantastic. All right, so we're going to hop over to a program from a company, I think they're based in Germany, called Elixir. And I've had this product for years now. And it's, you know, save for setting up a mannequin or having an actual subject matter and talent. It's a great way to um, learn lighting. It's not a replacement for doing it in the real world. Nothing ever is. But for me personally, it's a great way to understand how different lights work. There's other tools out there on the market that let you do some things similar to this. Um, Cine Tracer is great. It's on the Steam platform. It's uh, Matt Workman's program, and it lets you kind of go into worlds and set up things in in entire cities and and you know, outdoor and indoor or interior spaces, exterior spaces. But it's evolving slowly, and it is while a great program. And you know, if it's still eighty bucks, I don't think it's something that you shouldn't spend because there's benefit to using it for pre-vis and to work things out and to learn how to light, especially larger spaces, which I think is one of the big benefits. Um, it's not the program to jump into for every application. And you can, of course, go the Unreal Engine route, which is incredibly powerful, but also requires a very powerful computer system and GPU and also requires a lot of your time to learn. Um, the payoff, and I don't know Unreal Engine, can be huge because when you take a look at even their latest update to version five, some of the things that that 
is doing now in terms of replicating what happens in the real world with lighting, especially if you have the right setup PC. This is not a Mac base. You can run Unreal Engine on a, on a Mac, but it's not going to do the things that it's capable of doing right now. The whole quote unquote frenemy, I don't even think it's a frenemy relationship between Apple and Epic is not a good one. And, um, and as Mac users, we suffer because of that, unfortunately. So we'll see where things go. I have a feeling that it's going to be an interesting ride in the next year or two when it comes to the metaverse and um, what Apple might be doing with their new headset. Is there an authoring environment for that? How are you creating content? Might be some interesting things there. I don't know anything about it, but, you know, we can only think about what the future can be and we can dream. We can dream, kids. We can dream. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, fire off the questions over here. I'll be looking at them as I go through this stuff, but I'm going to turn my attention to over here and go over this with everybody. I think there's a way for me to do a picture in picture in Ecamm. In fact, I know there is, but quite honestly, um, who wants to see my ugly mug? And I think that's going to be annoying. So I'd rather focus on the application. Um, let me actually just check something really quickly, um, just so we can see. I don't know if it's sharing my screen here. I think it is. So if I go here, I just wanted to get an idea of how much this program is now. I know what I got it for before. Um, didn't know I was going through all of this. So the studio version, which is the full blown version with everything is 169. And then you have a basic version, which obviously has less fixtures and features and things like that. And that one is $84. Uh, we'll be looking at the studio version right now. And honestly, if you're going to use this tool to help you learn lighting, I think it can be pretty powerful. Um, I don't see the sharing though. So let's see if I can get that to work again. There you go. It's just because I popped into a different window. Again, I'm going to be looking for your questions over here. I'm going to take you through the purpose of this was not to teach you set a light. Um, it's just a good place to go to start talking about some of the things about these lateral and elevated light positions and sort of understanding some of that stuff. But um, by default, we'll definitely get into a little bit about the program as well. Um, I do recommend using, with this particular app, um, probably a multi-button mouse with some sort of scroll feature. It does make e getting around the app a little bit easier. Um, and, and basically, it's a lighting app, but over time, they have really updated this to not just be geared towards still photographers. So you can see here that I have a room that I opened up. Um, this room can be changed in terms of the size of the room, etc. So you can see here's a, a, a room and there's a large room, medium and small that you can start your project with. And then you can go in here and by, again, looking at the room, you can go in and change the ceiling color, the wall color, the floor color. Um, you can go in and again, change the size of the room that you're working with. And then going into the size of the room, you can even go ahead and increase or decrease the size of that room. If I wanted this to be um, 50 feet wide, you can also do this in meters if you want. Um, then you can do that. And then using the scroll wheel here, you can see that I've made a larger room. If I wanted it to be a 20-foot uh, wide room, then I could do that. And then you can see what that is. And then you, again, have control over that. Um, and then just sort of uh, basic, you know, again, you can go in and you can change your floor. They keep updating this. So let's just say I wanted to go in with more of an industrial carpet or I wanted to do something that was more of a wood floor. We're really not seeing that change right now because there's very little in the way of lighting. And I actually, with this light, have the intensity turned all the way down. So that's one of the reasons that you're not seeing those big changes. But again, clicking in the room, you can see that. I'm looking for questions, so I'll keep looking over here um, every once in a while. 
And then let's just take a look at some of the categories. So we have models in here. They have a, a, a number of models that are in here. I don't know if you can go in and purchase or add additional models, but they tend to do that. And once you have a model inside of the system and you have added them, which is just, I'll just double click on a different person here and add them to there, you'll see that there's a lot of options in terms of changing the hairstyle of the model, the hair color of the model. You can go in here and change the clothing of the model and what they're wearing. And you can also go in here and get very, very specific with predefined poses. You can go in here and actually change things related to the body and body size. And it gets very granular in terms of what you can do with each of those parameters. And you can even go in here and you can change things related to with sliders or by using these dots here, the face and the facial expression. Um, there's a pose slider here where you can change things over time through different poses. And I believe that you might be able to record that. That's not something that I really use the app for. And then, um, and then I'll just go ahead and delete that particular uh, model. And then we can go in here and see that there is a large library of different types of mono style lights with different modifiers and they keep adding them. I actually just updated to the latest version today and you can see there are a lot of different fixtures under mono light. We go under speed light and you can see there's a lot of options there. And then continuous light is pretty impressive. I remember when I first started using this, there was almost no continuous light fixtures in here. And as you can see here, they're even getting brand specific. So we've got aperture lights in here. We've got airy light fixtures inside of here. Um, we've got some, uh, the SL1 Max, which is the Lumiere uh, Roscoe light. We've got some Celeb lights, which are, uh, and Divas, which are Kino flows. You can see that there are also a bunch of kind of more typical and also somewhat not typical um, practical lights inside of here that are continuous lights, including the new candle. Got to get excited about the candle. We've got a light bulb. We've got a ball lamp, which is the one that I have here. And I chose that over just a, a, a straight bulb just because it's got a nice glow to it, but it's throwing light in all directions. Then there's a helper section. This is really for, uh, generally for bounce. So you'll see that we've got styrofoam or beadboard. Um, we've got light blockers for neg fill. We've got backgrounds. We've got diffusing, diffusion panels and reflectors. And then there's a huge library now. I mean, it's pretty huge compared to what it was. It used to have like a couple of things broken up into different categories. So you can start to build different spaces here. Um, out with walls and, and things like that. And I'm still scrolling, still scrolling, still scrolling. And you can see that they've designed this in a way so that you can set up, um, especially for previs and just learning how things are working, um, lots and lots of different props overall. So that's kind of the, the brief lay of the land here. And then we'll start to get into some other things so you can sort of see how they work. And right now you can see we just have a room, we have a camera, we have a model, and we have one light fixture. Um, you know, again, when I'm thinking about lighting as a whole, for me personally, I'm really starting with a single fixture, right? So let's just go ahead and we'll uh, kill the, at least the key here. I've still got a little bit of that kicker. I, I could actually go turn that off. And again, uh, Mitch, thanks for coming by, and I'll see you when you when you comment on the rewatch. So we're pretty much in darkness here. I'll take that little light right here, and you can see, you know, those different positions here in terms of lateral position and you know, sort of our 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 vertical position 
all of these create different moods. There's not a lot of output on this particular light. It's very low output. Um, it's a little bit harder because it doesn't have any diffusion. It's really an LED Edison bulb. But if I uh, turn on the B7C and we take a look at that, I can quickly get to a place if I hold it down where I've got a lot more light output from it. Um, it's a more dimmable light here. You can see there it is at full brightness. And then very easily, which is nice, that center button um, turns the light fixture on and off. But then if you double click on it, it changes color temperature, though, depending on what you're doing. And then, of course, it's app controllable as well. So you get very warm light, turn it back off, double click on it, it changes color. And then again, that, you know, the the different positions of the light are going to communicate different things. Intensity does as well, but obviously you you know that this is how we start to figure it out. But it's a this is a harder light source overall. It'll be more like what we're looking at in here for that other light inside of set of light. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. Let's go ahead and turn this back on. Hold on. Give me a second, everybody. We want technology to cooperate. It generally does. And we'll go ahead and start sharing again. All right. So no questions yet, but I'm looking out for them. So if we now take this fixture, this lets us see our room as we're working with it. But what I'm going to do is actually select the light. And you'll see some different features here. I can turn the light on and off pretty easily. Uh, I can change the intensity of the light here or with this heads up display. And then if you hover, um, you can change your light head. So it doesn't fix you into using that light once it's placed. You can go ahead and click on that and you can change which basically head is sitting on that. Well, this is not a stand because it's hanging, but that's one of the few ones that does. So um, I'm going to go in here and increase the intensity. This is replicating, as you can see right here, a 60, wall, uh, 60 watt output ball lamp. So you'd probably have an incandescent um, lamp inside of that, um, you know, inside of that ball lamp. Um, the light bulb is also a 60 watt, but it's more of a bare bulb. So I'll go back here and select that. And we can very easily move this light around just by clicking and dragging it. But if we want to be a lot more specific about where the light is, we can go in and use the Y and the X positions. We can type that in or we can just scroll left and right. Um, and then we can change the height of the light and where it's sitting. And then the pitch, roll, yaw, doesn't really matter with this light because it's a sphere. But obviously, if it was a different type of light fixture, you could. You can set the actual color temperature of the light itself. So you can dial that in. I'll just leave it at 32 for now. And then you have options for sort of the light shade itself. So in this case, because it's a, a, a ball light, it's the light fixture inside of it, which would be, again, replicating an incandescent bulb. And then we could change the actual color of the globe itself. So it'd almost be like it was being gelled or modified in terms of color temperature. I'm just going to leave that at white so it's neutral. And then we'll go up here and we'll select the camera itself. When we have the camera selected, you'll see that we can switch between a photo camera and a film camera. And that changes the options that are here and also up here over our frame that shows us our actual final uh, image and what we're looking at here. And there's a little focus box that I can move around. I'm usually going to put that over the subject's eye. I can change what type of sensor the camera is using, not brand, but the size of the sensor. I can change the aspect ratio that I'm looking at that in. So you can see that here. I can change whether or not I'm using one of quite a few zoom lenses or variable um, you know, focal length lenses, and then actual uh, prime lenses. 
And then we can go in here. You can see that we're looking at a, essentially a spherical lens here. But if I wanted to, I could change that to a anamorphic 1.33. Uh, so this would be now acting like an 85 millimeter anamorphic lens or a 2x anamorphic lens. And you can see that. And I'll just move that focus box back over the eye. And it's great because you can start to play with and start to understand the relationships between uh, an aspect ratio and the actual, um, you know, uh, frame size that you have and, and, you know, the types of lenses that you're using, so on and so forth. It's doing calculations in here also based on the frame rate. So that obviously has a lot to do with, it should be at least, let's say we go from uh, 2398 and let's go to, uh, just because avatars out, we'll go to 48 frames per second. And you'll see that we, we see a change of about a stop because we're now letting less light into the camera um, at 48 frames per second than we are at 24 frames or 2398 frames per second. So, you know, it's, it's come a long way. We can change our shutter angle here. 180 is pretty standard um, in terms of shutter angle. If we switch over and we change this to a photo camera, we'll see that our shutter is now being uh, based on basically shutter speed. So it will fit, it'll switch between the two. Again, a really nice upgrade when they came out with the new version of this program um, last year. Uh, we can change our T or our F-stop. I believe if we go to photography, it'll switch it over to an F or focal stop. And then over here, a T-stop, which really um, is more light transmission, like a true measurement of light transmission. ISO, um, color temperature is really, this is different than the light fixture itself. This is the white balance of the camera that you're using. And then you can see here that we can apply ND to our fixture as well. So really nice controls over there. And the controls that are live controls are very, very easy to use inside of here as well. So moving the camera around in the space itself is quite easy. You can do things like lock. If you look up here, rotate camera towards model, you can kind of lock the camera so that as it's moving, you can actually make sure that it's um, connected to the model. And then the model themselves also have some things where you can change it where they're always looking towards camera or based on that original pose, they're not. But if I have that second option set up um, and then the eye is within the frame and we can actually see it and I should probably make some changes here and let's get this light a little bit closer to our subject. Um, let's just go ahead and I'm gonna bump the ISO here to 1600 because I'm already the 2.8. We can see that with the model selected, if I change the eye position, it'll go away from camera or to camera. It's kind of like that creepy AI thing that everybody's seeing nowadays, but you get the basic idea. So what's nice about this is I can set my camera up to a particular um, position, and then I'll just go ahead and have the subject matter. <laughs> it gets a little creepy when you do that. I don't know what's better, the mannequins or this, but we're just center framing here, giving a little bit of a haircut. But you can see as I start to move the light around and we start to move it in the space, we can very quickly start to see what happens with different light position. And what I like about this is you can zoom out and in, but also to different positions. So if you did want to just grab the light and see what was happening, you can do that very easily. And then I could change the height of the light just by going in here and you can see what's happening there. And then let's just say, you know, I would normally shoot sort of targeted at an 800 as sort of a base. So we'll kind of do that at a 2.8. And you can see we're, we're very much in silhouette, but because that light is just ever so slightly camera right and over the subject matter's uh, left shoulder, what we're doing here is we're getting a little bit of a, a kick on the left side of their face. If I take that light and I start to move it a little bit more camera right, 
we'll start to wrap that light a little bit more. And what we're really doing here, if we take a look at it, is depending on where that light is in the space, um, we could be keying from camera side or we start to back key, which is you know really great because a lot of people haven't done a lot of back keying. And so they don't necessarily know what that looks like. And you know, being able to just take different types of light fixtures and see the result of those based on their position can be huge. I'm bringing it more towards camera now. So it's hanging out there. Let's take a look at where it is. It's actually just a little bit behind the camera. And then depending on that height that we were talking about, you can see that we start to get very different looks. Um, those eyes are pretty intense looking at camera right now. Uh, maybe we, we move them away or something like that. And you can see that, but then let's say I opened up, um, we'll just call this um, test uh, globe, globe uh, tests, and then we'll save it. And then I'll open up a, a different scene here. And this is one that I had been messing around with a while ago. And you can see over here, I've got um, basically a gobo as a projector here. So I've got a little bit of that happening. And then I've got something in the soft box, which is just shaping some light. I could change that to a different type of light fixture. The nice thing is that even when you're using the strobe lights or the speed lights and stuff like that, you can still modify them and see them as more continuous light if you want to. But really, it's this light category that you would be using most of the time if you wanted to have something that replicated um, a more traditional fixture. So if I, let's say we 86 that fixture there, you can see now all we have is the gobo playing. I can click on it. Um, I can, you know, change the intensity of that. It's way down right now anyway. I would actually have to change the output or the type of fixture I was using in order to get a different result from that. And, um, you know, that's kind of the way it works. But I'm going to leave that the way it is. The nice thing is if I wanted to just sort of quickly change the position of that, just like with the camera, it's very easy to position where that light is and where that uh, go-between or that projected um, pattern is in the space. I'm moving it now in a position where it's really just creating silhouette. So we start to get a little bit more noir -y. Um, but you get the basic idea. And then if I wanted to um, bring in a key light, let's say one of these continuous ones, let's just pick up something that makes sense. Um, I don't know. Let's go for, I saw that SL1 before. Let's see where that is. That's kind of a, a cool light here. It's SL1 mix. Double click on that. That light comes into play. I can go ahead and position it. Um, I can rotate it if I want to. And then, of course, intensity-wise, I want to bring that way, way down. Um, but we can start to see what it feels like in terms of the shadows it's casting and what it feels like when it's much closer to talent. And then also just sort of height overall. Let's go ahead and change this from a 40 mil to an 85 millimeter. And I'll move the focus over to our talent here. And you can start to see what happens with that fixture as I start to dim it up or down. And also what happens with the position and the shadow casting and everything else. Um, if I bring that really right towards camera and then I you know, bump the intensity up. And of course, the further away it is, the harder the light source is going to read. The closer it is to the subject matter, the softer it's going to read. Um, so it really just depends, but it's really a playground. What it allows you to do is it allows you to go in and really start to learn how to light within spaces. And once you start to add other props and things like that into the space, there's a ton that you can do. So we went a little bit over. I'm going to see if there's any questions that anybody has right now based on the stuff Everybody may have bailed, for all I know. Um, but are there any questions before we wrap this up? 
And hopefully some of that information that we covered in the last hour or so was beneficial. Even if you learned one tiny little thing, then it's worth it to me to spend the time to do this. But is there anything that you want to ask uh, about the stuff that I've covered? And there you go. Um, MCO Group. I brought it up before. The name of the software is Set a Light by a company called Elixir, which is E-L-I-X-X-I-E-R. And they are based out of Germany, I believe. Um, and the, the cool thing about the software, by the way, besides the cool stuff about the software, um, is it does let you look at the whole software in English, in German, uh, in French, in Portuguese. And I don't know, maybe that's... Maybe that's Mandarin, Chinese. I'm not sure. Uh, and you can set it to metric. You can set it to imperial. Um, there's a lot of quality settings and stuff that you can use. I'm on a much older MacBook Pro, and it seems to work just fine with the highest quality settings. And Steve Julin, come on. Are you kidding me? Come on doctor is in the house you should call me soon and we'll catch up and we'll do a zoom and have a drink together because i miss you um yes i miss you brandon thank you very much um it's great software and i think dylan that it's a worthy investment they're not a sponsor i use it as a tool to help me when I'm trying to get my head around lighting. And, you know, I think I know a lot about lighting. And then I decide to do something and I realize how much more I have to learn. It's just continuous. It never ends. So just when I sort of think, kind of got this, I kind of can do what's in my head and I can execute it. I come up with an idea or I start to lean towards a, a different style of lighting and I have to set stuff up, hence the studio space. And, uh, and when you don't have talent, I'm not embarrassed about it. Um, you got to have something to help you figure out how to do the lighting. So something like set a light will do that. Um, you know, but having a, a space that you can set things up in having something, even though, you know, it might be weird to some people for a lighting person to learn lighting. I don't think having a mannequin hurts. It allows you to figure out what happens, not exactly like it would with a person because the way reflected light uh, bounces off of people and different colored skin tones and things like that is, is very different than using a mannequin, but it can help you start to rough things in and start to figure out ratios and where things are. And it's very hard to set up a camera and then constantly step into the frame yourself. And it's very time consuming to do that. Um, Thaddeus asks, do I talk about lighting glass objects anywhere? I don't at the moment, but I would like to start doing more stuff that's tabletop related and start to do that. You can check out Caleb's um, channel, DSLR Video Shooter. He has a lot of tabletop stuff and he might cover that. There are for sure YouTube videos out there that are covering that type of stuff. And there's some great books on the subject. Let me see. Uh, I'm just going to take a look over here and see if I have one that might be a good one to recommend. Give me one second. Uh, yeah. All right, kids. This one. It's called... Uh, Tabletop photography. Um, it says using compact flashes and low cost tricks to create professional looking studio shots. Um, Cyril Harnischmacher. Harnischmacher. Um, but it's, you know, it kind of starts with the basics and goes in different approaches. I haven't dug into this book too much, but don't be afraid or turned off by the fact that it's about speed lights. Um, you know, really all a speed light is, 
is a burst of light at a particular intensity or output, but you're still lighting for ratios and you can apply what you learn with things like this for sure from uh, and using continuous lights. So, you know, basic concepts are the same. Last call for questions. Last call for questions. Wednesday, January 25th. I don't know how we're almost a 12th of the way through 2023 already, but I'm not complaining. Anybody? Spicoli? This, that? Uh, again, next week, Cameron Flask, myself, Ben Barden, Caleb Pike, will be talking about NAB 2023 workshops, answering production questions, having a good old time in a chat and a drink or two. Um, the following week is a question mark for me in terms of whether or not I'll be doing an episode. I'll try to get something up on the channel at least, but I may be traveling for a production going across country. So east and south or southeast to get some stuff done in the state that is long has many hurricanes and is considered by many to be sort of a, uh, a part of the northeast you know the state it's not georgia it might just be south of that so we'll see what happens uh, thank you everybody for watching for coming to the stream and for asking questions more questions, the better, generally. So um, I plan to do some more stuff like this. And what I'd like to do next time is kind of break this away, maybe do a little bit more set of light stuff, you know, with um, with this application. But I'd like to step away and kind of do some more stuff in the actual space itself. So again, hopefully you learned something. Steve, if you're still here, Dr. Detroit, reach out. Let's uh, catch up. See everybody soon. Take care.